Okay, here's your bonus information. This is uh, information that you may just want to know because you're going to be entering a clinic soon or you're in a clinic and you want to know why you use what you use um, for anesthetic agents with your animals. Um, or it could be that you want to do better on the test. And this is information that will be covered um, for specifically a couple of bonus um, questions on your test. So anesthetic agents, there are different classifications. We classify them based on the route of delivery, whether it's topical, oral, or injectable. What their primary use is, are they used as a pre-anesthetic, as a sedative, or tranquilizer, or an induction agent, and their drug class as well. So there are a couple different ways that we classify them. Most common uh, anesthetic agents that we use are agonists. Agonists are called agonists because they add, have an additive effect or they have an effect that is common or normal in the body. So they bind to receptors that you normally have in your body. You have receptors in your body to neurotransmitters um, in order for your body to function. These receptors um, will also take anything that looks like those neurotransmitters. So agonists, things that look like normal neurotransmitters, um, drugs that look like normal uh, neurotransmitters are most effective um, because they add, they sort of mimic the way the body is supposed to act, but at a greater effect. Okay, so agonists are what we most commonly use. We might use antagonists to block or re reverse the effect of an agonist. Those are called reversal agents. So if I give an agonist something that cause, causes sedation. Um, and I have an antagonist available, something that can reverse that sedation, that becomes a very safe way to do anesthesia. You can also have partial agonists. These partially bind to the receptors, but they exert more of a mild effect. So there's something that kind of mimic what's normal in the body, but they are a little off, um, and so you'll have kind of a mild effect, um, not as effective as an agonist. And then we'll also have things called mixed agonist antagonists um, that can reverse the effect of pure agonist, but also have a partial or mild effect as a partial agonist as well. Um, so a couple of different uh, things to think about as we think about anesthetic agents. First thing I want to talk about are anticholinergics. Now when we talk in anatomy and physiology about nervous system, the nervous system, we're going to talk about acetylcholine, we're going to talk about norepinephrine, epinephrine. The nervous system has neuro these neurotransmitters that produce a specific effect that causes your body to act in a specific way to different stimulus. So anticholinergics are uh, the blocking of mostly acetylcholine type things. So we give these as pre-anesthetic agents or as needed during anesthesia. So they're called, just know right now, they're just called anticholinergics. Um, they help block the parasympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system, you have, you have a nervous system, your whole nervous system in your body has two sides to it. There's the parasympathetic side and the sympathetic side. It's really easy to remember the sympathetic side because that's your fight or flight. So anything that happens during fight or flight, that is the sympathetic side. The parasympathetic side we refer to as rest and digest. So it would make sense um, that if we have something that is a cholinergic, that it helps you to either digest something or to calm down and relax. Anticholinergics, why would we want to use an anticholinergic? Well, if you relax too mu much, your heart rate will slow down and sometimes to a dangerous level. So we give anticholinergics to block the parasympathetic nervous system, prevent bradycardia. It also prevents hypersalivation. So if you've ever seen um, somebody who's really sleepy and drools a lot, okay, they're, they're in this rest and digest um, because then salivation is part of digestion. Um, so think about it that way. We're, we're trying to lower those secretions uh, and lower the, the uh, stop the bradycardia. Okay, so preventing bradycardia, preventing hypersalivation, that's what anticholinergics do. The common anticholinergics you will see, the most common right now that you will see is atropine. And the reason for that is atropine and glycopyrrolate are both very common and they both work really well. Right now, atropine is just cheaper um, and so it's more often used in uh, the small animal and large animal industry. Now, they are they come in two different concentrations or two different strengths. There's a small animal side and a large animal side. If you work in a mixed animal practice, you do not want to mix those up, okay? So small animal uh, concentrations and large animal concentrations are different. 
they do have some potential side effects, and you do need to be aware of that. Anytime you give too much of something, it's going to cause a, a problem. So if you give too much of something that's supposed to prevent bradycardia, obviously uh, we can get um, tachycardia, so increased heart rate, cardiac arrhythmias, bronchodilation, midriasis, which is uh, the uh, pupils are dilating, and uh, ileus, which means that the uh, intestines stop working. So th these are all things that would happen if your par um, parasympathetic um, system was, was completely blocked. Okay, so anticholinergics, we give anticholinergics as pre-medications to mitigate or, or make more mild the side effects of tranquilizers and sedatives, okay? So when we're talking about tranquilizers and sedatives, these are restraint for minor procedures or to get the pet ready to accept an induction agent or a general anesthesia. Phenothiazines and benzodiazepines are both um, sedatives or tranquilizers, excuse me. Phenothiazine is a major one, benzodiazepines are minor ones. The effect of phenothiazine is to calm and sedate for pregeneral anesthesia. Most common one we see is acepromazine. There's no reversal for it, so we do have to be careful with it. It can cause seizures, especially in animals that are more prone to seizures, so we're very careful with acepromazine. Benzodiazepines um, are used in combination with other agents and do have a wide range of effects, including their anti-anxiety, which is anxiolytic, pain relief, and sedation. Some examples, diazepam, midazolam, and zolazepam. So diazepam you may know as Valium. Um, there are no reversals for these as well. You do have to be careful with the use of them. So those tranquilizers are phenothiazine and benzodiazepine, okay? Um, Sedatives, a uh, sedative, an alpha-2 adrenergic drug. So adrenergic means adrenaline, think adrenaline. And when we think adrenaline, we think fight or flight, right? And so that's the sympathetic side. There are certain receptors, uh, alpha-1, alpha-2, alpha uh, beta-1, beta-2, receptors that uh, accept and then cause certain effects in the body. This alpha-2 adrenergic drug stimulates the alpha-2 receptor in the sympathetic side. Um, these sedatives are used alone or in combination with opioids, dissociatives, and other agents, and they have a wide range of effects. Some examples are xylazine, um, uh, which is also known as rompin, uh, dexmedetomidine, uh, known as domator, detomidine, and romithidine. Um, they do have reversals, which is fantastic. Xylazine is reversed by uanhimbine, and then the rest are uh, reversed by adipamazole or telazoline. So th it is nice to have reversals because that makes these uh, sedatives much safer to use. You can, you can, uh, uh, you're careful with the dose, but if you do have an animal that has a bad reaction to it, you can reverse it. Opioids, um, there are agonists, partial agonists, mixed agonists, antagonists, and antagonists for opioids. Um, agonists are very strong acting, okay? So if you look at the com over at the common names of opioids that are agonists, you'll see morphine, fentanyl, oxymorphone, hydromorphone. These are all agonists. Um, they, affect, they have effects at the mu receptors. It varies by species, but usually we see analgesia, which is pain relief and sedation. Um, but there's also, you know, so we, there are a lot of reasons to use it, but there are a lot of adverse effects, and it is a class two controlled substance. Um, reversal, the antagonist is naloxone or naltrexone, trexone, Narcan is something that you may have heard of. Uh, butorphanol is a mixed agonist antagonist, so obviously it, is, it has um, some partial reversal effects as well. Uh, buprenorphine um, is a partial agonist. It, it is, has a partial effect at the mu receptors, some pain relief, some sedation. It is class three controlled substance. Um, when we say class two, class three, class two controlled substances are more addictive than class three. Class one controlled substances are things that we don't use in medicine because they are highly, highly addictive. A class one would be something like heroin. Um, class two, uh, we have to log separately. We have to order separately. Class three and four, um, we, we log together. Um, you use a drug log on those two things together. We order them in a pretty normal way. Um, the mixed agonist antagonist works at kappa receptors and mu receptors, and that example is butorphanol. 
tranquilizers and sedatives. So um, some more tranquilizers and sedatives we might use. These This group is called dissociatives. Dissociatives, they're also the known as cyclohexamines because of their organic structure, their chemical structure. Um, it can, it's an injectable anesthetic that's, that can be used alone. We do not recommend it because it just immobilizes patients. It does not control pain, it, uh, pain and it is not anesthesia. Um, it can cause the animal to um, have a, a poor reaction because uh, they get very stressed. Um, it does have an unusual effect on vitals. They have normal or even increased muscle tone, sensitivity to light and sound, intact reflexes, increased heart rate, and increased blood pressure. Some examples would be ketamine or teletamine. Uh, it is a controlled substance. It is something that um, uh, people will use uh, to get a high. It's uh, if when you hear about roofies or special K, uh, that's what we're talking about. Um, so we like to give it with other tranquilizers or sedatives um, that reduces the adverse effects. We can add pain relief to that. We can make them more calm and less anxious. Um, do not recommend using these things alone. For in, uh, induction agents, things that will get the animal sleepier so we can open up their mouth and place a tube in there so we can maintain them on gas anesthesia, which is much safer. Two products that we typically use IV would be propofol and alfaxin. Um, propofol is a short-acting IV anesthetic, um, same as alfaxan. They both induce and maintain general anesthesia. Um, propofol is a phenolic uh, compound. It's not a controlled substance. Actually, neither is alfaxan. Uh, it is the one of the only cloudy liquids that you can give IV. In fact, you can only use IV there are only like two substances in all of medicine, um, cloudy substances that we that have suspension, suspended uh, particles in it that we can give safely IV. Everything else, if it's cloudy, do not get it, give it in the vein. Um, the problem that with propofol that we've had is that it is in a medium that will support bacteri bacterial growth. So if once you open it, you need to refrigerate it and, and use it that day. Um, and you have to use a septic technique. So once you open that bottle, you need to use it. Um, big thing for both of these um, is that they do have um, uh, respiratory effects. So if you give it too quickly, you, you want to give it in a nice slow rate, but if you give it too quickly, the animal will actually stop breathing and you have to ventilate for them. So you want to be very careful with that. So these are the two IV things that we're using uh, right now. Now, propofol does make, um, uh, I think it's Zoetis is the company here. They do make something, it's called Propofol 28. It's not approved for use in cats, but it is approved for use in dogs. It is something that has a, a preservative in it that will allow it to stay uh, good for 28 days. So Propofol 28 used in dogs. Some other tranquilizers and sedatives you might see for general anesthesia or induction agents or seizures or euthanasia. Um, the group of uh, barbiturates in which euthanasia solution uh, is, is uh, contained or classified. Um, we can use barbiturates and have used barbiturates in the past for general anesthesia, treatment of seizures, see phenobarbital, right, um, in euthanasia. Um, there are sh ultra short acting, short acting, intermediate acting, and long acting uh, types of barbiturates. It's been used uh, for years, hundreds of years, <laughs> nearly hundreds of years. Um, for anesthesia, uh, and, and the euthanasia solution that we use is pentobarbital sodium, and it's basically an overdose of anesthesia, okay? Um, imidazole derivative sedatives are hypnotics. Um, they have no analgesia qua analgesic quality, which means no pain relief. Very short-acting, injectable. It's not a controlled substance. It's pretty safe. It's called atomidate. I have be honest, I haven't seen it used in the clinic for a long time. If you're seeing it used in your clinic, let us know how you use it. Um, muscle relaxants and sedatives. Um, there's one called guafenicin. It's also called GG or glycerol glycolate. Um, it's the, the uh, ingredient that you find in mucinex. So we use guafenicin as an, um, a mucolytic, something that breaks down muc uh, mucus. Um, but it also, in horses specifically, helps to smooth transitions 
um, from uh, you know the, the pre-anesthetic uh, to the to the full sedation or anesthesia. So it helps to to relax and and calm it. That's all I have for anesthetics. If you can remember all of those things that we went through, uh, you will be in good standing um, at your clinic. Um, have a better understanding of, of every all the injections that the animals are given, and you will do better on the exam. Thanks for listening.